Hello to you. I do hope you're well. Welcome to this AQA A-Level Religious Studies video. I'm Ben Wardle and today we are talking about ethics applications. So in the exam, we could be asked to apply natural moral law, situation ethics or virtue ethics to a moral issue that is named on the specification. So in this video, we are going to talk through how you can apply natural moral law, situation ethics and virtue ethics to those different moral issues. And remember, we could be asked an AO1 10 mark question or an AO2 15 mark question that asks us to apply an ethical theory to a moral issue. So we will be looking at both types of question today and we'll be looking at how you can secure the top marks in either. So let's get started, shall we, with a quick overview of what we actually need to know when it comes to ethics applications. And the first thing we need to know is our ethical theories. It is so important that you are an expert on natural moral law, situation ethics and virtue ethics. So we need to know our AO1 knowledge about each of those ethical theories and the key components of each one. And we also need to know, of course, our AO2 evaluation points. So you need to know your strengths and your weaknesses for each ethical theory. So for example, you need to know what's good about it and also what criticisms there are as well. So that is the first thing we need to know. We need to be experts on natural moral law, situation ethics and virtue ethics. What we then need to know are the human issues that are named on the specification by AQA. And they are theft, lying, embryo research, cloning, designer babies, abortion, euthanasia and capital punishment. And it's really important that we are starting to think what would each of those ethical theories say about these issues. And when I say what would they say, what I mean is would they support that human issue or would they oppose it? So we need to be thinking about the key components of each ethical theory, for example, the five primary precepts. And we need to be thinking if we apply that to the issue of abortion, would natural moral law, would Aquinas support abortion or oppose it? So we are thinking about the key components of the ethical theories we've studied and we are then applying them to the human issues. And that is where we are saying whether that ethical theory would support or oppose that issue. We then have the non-human issues, and these are all about animals and how human beings use animals. So again, if we look at the AQA specification, we need to be ready to apply our ethical theories to the following non-human issues. And they are animals as food, including intensive farming, animal testing, animal cloning, blood sports, and animals as a source of organs for transplant. And again, you need to be thinking about your ethical theories and what they would say about these issues. So, for example, you could talk about Aristotle's hierarchy of souls and the fact that human beings with their rational soul are at the top of the hierarchy above animals who are beneath them because they have a sensitive soul. And so you could make an argument there that virtue ethics would support the use of animals in ways that are advantageous to human beings because we are higher up them or higher than them, excuse me, in the hierarchy, because we have a rational soul. So you've got to be thinking, as I say, about your key understanding of those ethical theories and the key components of them. And you've then got to, as the title of this video suggests, apply them. You've got to be asking, what would Aquinas say? What would Fletcher say? What would Aristotle say? And we're going to look at how to do this in this video. So please don't panic. Please don't worry. By the end of this video, I feel quite confident that you will be confident for any applications question that could come up in the exam. So talking of questions that could come up, here are a couple of examples of past paper questions from the exam board that are ethics application based. So here they are. We could have natural moral law solves the moral problems of abortion. Evaluate this statement. Situation ethics cannot justify the use of animals in blood sports. Again, evaluate the statement. There's an example of a 10 marker here. Examine the approach to moral decision making taken by natural moral law. You must illustrate your answer with reference to the issue of capital punishment. 
Another 15 marker here, virtue ethics cannot solve the issues raised by using animals as a source of organs for transplants. And finally, virtue ethics has no satisfactory answer to the ethical problems of embryo research. So what you can see there is that the examiner always names an ethical theory and they also name a moral issue. And then the question is all about us considering the application of that ethical theory to the moral issue. So when we look at these questions and when we think about what the exam specification tells us, I think we can conclude that there are three types of questions that come up when it comes to ethics applications. The first is an AO1 application question, which is when you are going to identify two or three components of that ethical theory and you are going to apply it to the moral issue. And I will show you how to do that in just a moment. We could also get an AO2 question, which asks us to evaluate the application. So that's where we're not just stating what the ethical theory would say, but we're then making an overall judgment about whether natural moral law can justify abortion, for example, or whether virtue ethics would permit euthanasia. So remember, with our AO2 questions, with our 15 markers, we are not just stating facts. We also need to include our critical analysis and we need to make a judgment. So you would need to have a conclusion about whether that ethical theory supports or opposes that moral issue. And then we could also get an AO2 question, which is about evaluating the helpfulness of that ethical theory. And this is where you're going to be making a judgment about whether that ethical theory provides clarity. Is that ethical theory helpful for resolving moral dilemmas? So, for example, a, you know, a classic criticism of virtue ethics is that because it is so focused on character development, it doesn't give us clear, specific rules. And so you could say, actually, Aristotle's virtue ethics is not helpful when it comes to resolving moral dilemmas such as euthanasia, because it's too interested in character development rather than giving us clear answers. Whereas if you were writing about natural moral law, you could say that natural moral law is really helpful for resolving the moral problem of euthanasia, to use that example again, because it gives us clear, fixed primary precepts such as the preservation of life and the ordering of society, which you could say give us real clarity on the issue, on how to resolve the issue and to say that euthanasia is wrong, for example. So these are the three things that I want you to be thinking about and the three types of question I want you to be preparing for. We need to be thinking about a 10 marker that asks us to apply the key components from the ethical theory to a moral issue. We need to be thinking about an AO2 question where we're being asked to make a judgment about whether natural moral law, situation ethics or virtue ethics would support, whether it would justify that moral issue. And then also a potential AO2 question on the helpfulness of the ethical theory. So does it provide us with clear answers? Does it provide us with a really um, concrete solution to the problem? Is it a solution that everybody will agree with? You know, for example, natural moral law and situation ethics both depend on belief in God. So we could say, actually, they're not helpful in the 21st century when not everybody does believe in a God. So lots for us to think about today. But as I say, I don't want you to worry. This is a really great type of question to get in the exam because it is a great opportunity to showcase your knowledge of the ethical theory and secure the top marks that you deserve. So let's have a look at the key components from each of our ethical theories, because these are what you need to apply when you are in that exam room faced with an AO1 or an AO2 question. So with natural moral law, if we are asked to apply natural moral law to a moral issue, these are the applications to consider. Now, you do not need to include in your answer all of them. Of course you don't. I would be saying you need to pick out a maximum of three. So for me, the three that I would be picking out for natural moral law are I would be referring to at least one of the primary precepts, 
I would be referring to the doctrine of double effect and probably proportionalism as well. But it's up to you which key components of the ethical theory you are going to apply to the moral issue. As long as you choose them, you name them and you apply them, you are going to get the marks. So you could talk in your uh, application answer when it comes to natural moral law about the synderesis principle. So you could apply that to the moral issue and say that at the core of natural moral law is the belief that humans should do good and avoid evil in everything. So you've got to think, is that moral issue going to help human beings to do good and avoid evil? Is it consistent with the synderesis principle? If it is, you could make an argument that Aquinas and his natural moral law would support it. You could make a reference, you could make an application, I should say, to the four tiers of law, the eternal law, divine law, natural law and human law. So you could refer to one of the Ten Commandments, for example, as an example of a divine law. The five primary precepts, as I say, really do need to be in there. Whenever you are applying natural moral law, make sure you refer to at least one of the primary precepts and talk about whether that that moral issue would uphold one of the primary precepts or whether it would violate the primary precept. So things like abortion and euthanasia or capital punishment, we can always say violate the preservation of life and therefore Aquinas' natural moral law would be against those issues. But at the same time, something like capital punishment, you could say actually it upholds the ordering of society because it provides a really strong and effective deterrent against breaking the rules. Um, but all that you need to do is pick one or two of those primary precepts and apply them. We've also, of course, got the secondary precepts, the practical rules that are derived from the five primary precepts, things like do not kill, of course, which is based on the preservation of life precept. We've also then got those developments on natural moral law, which I always think it's important to include in an applications question. As I say, I would be aiming to write um, a paragraph on one or two primary precepts, and then a paragraph on the doctrine of double effect or proportionalism. So remember, the doctrine of double effect is making that distinction between your good intention and then an unintended side effect of that. Aquinas, of course, himself gave the example of killing in self-defense. So could one of those moral issues be justified by the doctrine of double effect? We then, of course, have the more contemporary development of proportionalism, which is that you should always follow the law, follow the rule unless there is a proportionate reason to break it. And again, that's always quite easy to include in your answer because you can always make an argument that in extreme circumstances, a proportionalist would say that you can break the rule because you have a proportionate reason to do so. So again, always really quite a nice one, quite an easy one to include in your applications there. If we take a look then at situation ethics, what are the key components of situation ethics that we need to be applying? Well, again, you know, there are several here on the screen for you. I don't want you to include them all. You need to pick two or three that you are going to apply. So for me, I would always be referring to the agapeic calculus and the idea that for situation ethics, the morality is always judged and decided on a case by case basis. So actually situation ethics doesn't really provide us with anything to go off other than judge it on the situation, make a decision in the moment. I would also be referring to at least one of the four presuppositions and to the six working principles. Again, you do not need to refer to them all in your answer. Pick one of them, potentially two of them, and say how that would either support or go against that moral issue. For example, blood sports, for example, capital punishment. So let's just talk through them. Situationism, remember, it is situation ethics. And Joseph Fletcher said the morality of an action is dependent on the situation. And that means there are no fixed rules. Remember, he rejected legalism. And he said to reject the legalists, love of laws and only follow the law of love. So the one guiding rule in situation ethics is to apply agape love. So you would want to mention that in your answer and you would want to say that for the situation ethicist, their priority is pursuing and maximising agape. So will this moral issue help to maximise agape? Is it an agapeic thing to do? And of course, they would calculate that by using the agapeic calculus.
We also have, of course, our four presuppositions. So, for example, positivism, which is belief in a God of love and personalism, which is to put people before rules. And I actually think that's another one that you can use quite frequently in your applications because it's about prioritizing people. Um, so obviously don't refer to all four of them, but pick one or two of them and say whether that presupposition would be supportive of that moral issue or it would actually condemn it. We've then got our six working principles. Again, pick one, potentially two. Love is the only absolute. Christian decision making is based on love. Justice is love distributed. Uh, so again, capital punishment, you could say actually, you know, situation ethics might support capital punishment because justice is love distributed and it could be the most just thing if that person has committed a really terrible crime. We could say love wills the neighbours good whether you like them or not. Only the end justifies the means. That is a great one to use. I would really recommend using that one because you could say, you know, the end goal of what you're doing justifies it. Things like euthanasia. The end goal is to put somebody out of their pain and suffering and love's decisions are made situationally, not prescriptively. Finally, always nice to refer to the fact that for situation ethicists, they are following the example of Jesus. So they would be looking to the Gospels to see what Jesus did, things like breaking the rule to do the most loving thing. And our classic example of that is that he healed on the Sabbath. So you absolutely could include a reference to Jesus and the fact that situation ethics is all about following his example if you did have an ethics application question on situation ethics. And then finally, virtue ethics. What are our key components of virtue ethics that we would be applying to a moral issue? Well, again, let me just show you my top picks in terms of what I would be applying. I would always make a reference to eudaimonia and the fact that a situation, not a situation ethicist, excuse me, that a follower of virtue ethics would always be thinking what will contribute to human flourishing, what will help to maximise human flourishing. So I'd always be referring to eudaimonia, a great quote there from Aristotle that eudaimonia is activity in accordance with excellence. I would also be referring to at least one of the virtues. I would be talking about whether that moral issue would actually be in accordance with one of the uh, cardinal virtues of justice, prudence, temperance or fortitude, or whether it would go against it. So, for example, you know, with temperance, that's all about moderation. And I could say that designer babies actually violates that virtue because it's going too far. It's misusing scientific developments. You know, it's going, as I say, too far. It's going beyond what arguably medical science should be used for. So I could say it's not showing temperance, but then I could also say that it shows fortitude, it shows bravery, that people are pioneering new medical treatments and they're using the knowledge that they have and the resources that they have to do something new and innovative. So, you know, we've always got to be thinking about the different virtues, whether that moral issue would actually uphold or violate one of Aristotle's cardinal virtues. You can also think about the other moral virtues and also, of course, the intellectual virtues. With quite a few of these topics, it's talking about scientific developments. And of course, one of his intellectual virtues was episteme, yeah, which comes from that keyword epistemology. So we could say, you know, that actually this research, this animal testing actually upholds the intellectual virtue of episteme because it helps us to make new scientific discoveries, which is something Aristotle would approve of because one of his intellectual virtues was all about scientific knowledge, gaining knowledge and understanding of the world around you. We also have the golden mean, always the great one to refer to. So you've got to think, is this moral issue going to meet the golden mean criteria or is it an excess of something? Is it going too far? Is it a deficiency? I always like to get in there for Ronesis, one of my favourite features of virtue ethics, the importance of having and using practical wisdom. So remember, a Ferroni Moss is an expert in practical wisdom. So you could make a reference in the exam to a Ferroni Moss and the question of what would they do? Would a Ferroni Moss support this moral issue? Would they support animal testing? Would they agree with euthanasia, for example? So remember, with virtue ethics, it is very much about the cultivation of 
practical wisdom so that people, when they are faced with these moral issues, can make those judgments and they can make those decisions. And I think linking in with that, we've got that really contemporary development on virtue ethics, which is always great to include. It's Barry Schwartz and practical wisdom. Remember, he said that you should know the person with practical wisdom will know when to follow the rule and when not to follow the rule. And he gave, of course, the hospital janitor case study who shouldn't just follow their job description, but they should use practical wisdom as well. And you could say, you know, you've got to apply in that situation that practical wisdom. You've got to make a judgment about what the wisest thing to do is. In terms of the other points on here, then, that I would like you to keep in mind, always remember that virtue ethics is focused on good character, not specific rules. So if you have got an AO2 question, for example, on whether virtue ethics is helpful, you could say it's not helpful because it doesn't give us clear rules. Although it leads to better people in society, it doesn't help us to deal with particular moral issues because it is more focused on virtues to cultivate rather than giving us concrete rules to follow. And then the other one to consider, especially with the non-human issues, is the hierarchy of souls. Remember that human life is seen as most valuable. It is at the top of Aristotle's hierarchy because we have a rational soul, which is higher than the sensitive soul and the vegetative soul. So always helpful if you are asked about virtue ethics being applied to non-human issues, to animal ethics, you can make a reference there to the hierarchy of souls. So that is our key AO1, isn't it, in terms of the key components of each ethical theory and then how you can apply them to the different moral issues. In terms of your AO2 then, remember, you could be asked about whether the ethical theory is helpful. So in terms of thinking about whether it is helpful, what we're being asked is not necessarily what would the theory say, but is it helpful to use? So what kind of things might we say? Well, if we're talking about natural moral law, we could say is helpful because it provides us with five clear primary precepts. It therefore gives us universal moral standards. So there is consistency. We could say it's helpful because it values human life, for example, the preservation of life precept. And of course, there is then some flexibility introduced to it by proportionalism. In terms of why it might be called unhelpful, though, where it might be criticised, we could say, well, it does require belief in God. You know, we've got the divine law as one of the four tiers of law, and we've got worshipping God as one of the five primary precepts. So you could say that all five precepts may not still be relevant. So just because a moral issue violates one of the precepts, that doesn't mean it should be condemned as wrong. So you could argue that actually natural moral law is not very helpful because it requires belief in God and it may be a bit outdated for modern moral decision making. With situation ethics, you can say it's helpful for Christians because it allows them to emulate Jesus. It is based around his key teaching of agape and putting that into practice. So they would like this as a guide. It's also, you know, seen as helpful because it gives autonomy to individuals. It empowers the individual to use their agapeic calculus and make that judgment for themselves. We could say it's helpful because it provides flexibility, which means that it can accommodate and adapt to these modern moral decisions and these modern moral dilemmas. You know, we could argue that, well, with natural moral law, when that was devised, things like cloning didn't exist in the way that they do now. Situation ethics, because it is so flexible, can be seen as much more helpful because it can be applied. We could also say it's helpful because it does take situations into account and it prioritises people. As we said, personalism, one of the four presuppositions, it prioritises people. However, we could argue it's unhelpful because it doesn't actually give us any clear rules, unlike natural moral law and the precepts, for example. Although, obviously, you could um, re respond to that. A rebuttal to that could be that there are six working principles. You could say it also requires belief in God. Remember, positivism is belief in a God of love. So actually, it's not helpful because not everybody can use it. You could say it gives too much autonomy to individuals. Remember Barclay's criticism that it would work if all people were saints but they're not. So it gives people too much autonomy. And so you could end up justifying anything that could lead to moral chaos and decay.
You could say, again, that it's too situational. It's actually too flexible. So it can't give us any clarity. There is no consistency here. It can't be universally applied because it is on a case by case basis. And then, as I said, it can justify pretty much anything. So is it actually a helpful moral theory if it doesn't have any set standards or clear guidelines other than do the most loving thing? And then finally, virtue ethics. We could say it is helpful because it gives people moral skills. It's focused on developing phronesis and it sees that as the task of a lifetime. It again gives autonomy to individuals, reflecting Aristotle's focus on reason and the importance of using reason. We could say that in contrast to the other two, a good thing about it is that it's secular. It, remember, is actually from a time before Christianity, from ancient Greece, um, and so it can be widely used. And building on that, we can say the virtues, the cardinal virtues, are widely admired. We see them in many different forms, in many different cultures and traditions. We could also say it is helpful today because of the contemporary revival of eudaimonianism. So, you know, many modern um, ethicists, such as Barry Schwartz, have really revived virtue ethics and have shown that it is still relevant. Even though it was devised in ancient Athens, it can still contribute to modern moral decision making, especially in a post-religious time. And then obviously we could refer to those modern developments. We could talk about Schwartz, for example, who does take situations into account. And, you know, he says with the hospital janitor example, that you do need to use your veronesis, your practical wisdom. So we could say the fact that that is included means that it is helpful because it takes into account the complexities, difficulties and the challenges, as well as the ambiguities of modern life. However, why could it be called unhelpful? Well, you could say there are no clear rules. As we said, it's based on character. And so it doesn't give us clear rules to follow. Building on that, we could say it's therefore impractical. It doesn't actually work in the real world where we need clear rules that give us clear directions on what to do. You could say as well that the virtues are actually subjective, not universal. Different cultures have different virtues, especially in the modern world. Things that are valued in the Western world, for example, would maybe not be valued in the same way in other parts of the world. So there are different virtues that different cultures have. And finally, discriminatory to animals. You could say that the hierarchy of souls actually discriminates against animals and so it's not helpful for resolving non-human issues in the 21st century where animal rights has become a big thing where animal rights are taken much more seriously than they would have been in ancient Greece when Aristotle was devising this theory and in particular his hierarchy so plenty to think about for you there I hope the final thing I want to look at today then is actually what this looks like in the exam so I want us to look at how you should structure a 10 mark or a 15 mark application question and then also I want to share with you the AQA mark schemes from some previous applications questions so that we can really start to think about our exam technique and we can think about applying the applications to the exam so in terms of a 10 mark question, I always say with your 10 markers, aim to write three paragraphs. So I would want to see three clear paragraphs which are grounded in, as always, knowledge and understanding. So it's all about explanation, isn't it? So here's how I would structure this. My first paragraph, I might do an overview of the ethical theory. Or I might go straight into my first application. It's completely up to you. We just need to make sure the examiner feels confident you know the ethical theory. So I would be doing, as I say, either an overview of the ethical theory. For example, if it's a A01 question where it says examine natural moral law with reference to, then in that case, my first paragraph would be an overview paragraph. But if the question is literally just saying that it wants me to apply then I might just start with an application. So it is up to you. But for each of your paragraphs, and I would be aiming to write free, I want to see you explain a key concept from the theory applied to the issue. So I want to see you explain him one or two of the primary precepts. I want to see an explanation of one or two of the four presuppositions. I want to see an explanation of the hierarchy of souls or of the... Um, 
I'm trying to think of what I want to see applied now, um, or of the golden mean, or of one or two of the virtues of eudaimonia, for example. And remember, you are explaining it. You're using phrases like, this shows, this would mean, the implication would be, Aquinas would therefore say, Aristotle would therefore assert, Fletcher's situation ethics would lead to the judgment that... So always be thinking, what is the key concept from the ethical theory? And then let's apply it to the issue. So that's all you need to do for a 10 mark question. Remember, you're not making a judgment there about whether the ethical theory would support that moral issue or even whether the ethical theory is helpful for resolving that moral issue. You need to avoid doing that in a 10 marker. It will not get you any marks. You just need to explain the key concept from the theory applied to the issue. That is it. With your 15 marker, however, that is where you're going to get those marks for evaluating, for having that critical analysis, for developing your line of argument. So with every 15 marker you write, I would always recommend you start with a thesis statement that sets out your conclusion. This essay will argue that. This essay will conclude that. And remember, this has got to give us a one sentence preview of your conclusion. So you've got to read that statement that they give you in the question and make your judgment. What is your essay going to conclude? Are you going to be agreeing with that statement or disagreeing with that statement? And then, of course, your first main paragraph is going to be supporting your thesis. So you need to explain an argument in support of your thesis. You need to name a concept from the theory and include an explanation and or an example. And you need to link back. So if the statement is about situation ethics would justify abortion, then you need to be explaining something from situation ethics. So one of the presuppositions, the working principles, the agapeic calculus, for example. And you need to be using that to explain why situation ethics would or would not support the issue of abortion. You then, of course, need to give the opposing side of the argument. So you need to give the counter argument against your thesis. Again, you need to make sure with the application's questions that you include a concept from the theory and you need to apply that concept to the issue. So you need to be saying, again, that, for example, one of the working principles would go against abortion and explain to me why. So you need to make sure that with your applications questions, you're always linking in a key concept from the ethical theory and you're saying how that would either support or oppose the moral issue. Your third paragraph is then going to be in support of your thesis again. So we're back to agreeing with your thesis. This is now your second argument in support of your thesis. And again, you're going to name a concept from the theory, including an example or well, no, not all, always with explanation. Make sure you are explaining here. And then finally, conclude. I want two or three sentences on how the essay has proven your thesis statement to be correct. So we're using exactly the same 15 mark structure that we always do for our 15 markers. But remember, you need to include in each paragraph a reference to the moral issue, of course, and a key concept from the ethical theory. And you're taking that key concept from the ethical theory, whether that is one of the virtues or whether that is the doctrine of double effect, and you are saying why that would either support or oppose the moral issue, whether that would justify or it would not justify that moral issue. And then at the end, really importantly, you are concluding, you are reaching a judgment. Would natural moral law overall support abortion? Would situation ethics overall support blood sports? Would virtue ethics overall support capital punishment? And you need to make your conclusion or you need to reach your conclusion. You need to make your judgment there. So let's just have a look at this in practice, shall we? And we'll start actually with the 10 mark question. So AQA have already asked this question and it gives us a really nice insight into how they're going to structure these questions and what they're expecting us to answer or how they're expecting us to answer. Excuse me, I clearly cannot speak today. Do apologise for my inability to articulate in this video, but hopefully you are still taking away some good things that will help you get that A star. So examine the approach to moral decision making taken by natural moral law. You uh, must illustrate your answer with reference to the issue of capital punishment. So, as I say, with my planning here, my first paragraph would be an overview, I think, of natural moral law. And then paragraphs two and three would be applications. So 
here's what the exam board said. They said that with natural moral law, reason leads to primary precepts, such as the preservation of innocent life and living in an ordered society, together with secondary precepts, such as the forbidding of both abortion and consensual sex outside marriage. The purpose of the primary precepts is to lead to human happiness or flourishing and to union with God. Some might discuss how far such precepts allow or forbid capital punishment. So other than that final sentence, I actually think that would be quite a nice paragraph to actually write yourself. Obviously, that final sentence is a guide for the examiners on what people, what students might actually write. So here's some exemplar material for you. You could be saying that Aquinas holds that capital punishment is legitimate, for example, arguing that if it is lawful to kill a wild beast that is harmful to the community, then it must be lawful to kill a human evildoer in order to protect the community. This cannot be done by private individuals, since this would become mere personal revenge. To administer capital punishment must be the responsibility of a public authority. So I would probably be linking that in with the primary precept for the ordering of society there. They've also put here that historically the Catholic Church, following Aquinas, of course, has allowed capital punishment, for example, in order to defend innocent humans against an unjust aggressor. So again, ordering of society there is the precept I'd be referring to. Not sure why they haven't, but I think that's what I would definitely include for the A star. Today, the Catholic Church is generally against capital punishment on the grounds that it goes against the commandment not to murder. So I'd be referring to the divine law there and it violates the precept to preserve human life. Other Catholics acknowledge that the Bible specifies the death penalty for some crimes, so there may be justification for its use in exceptional circumstances. So my takeaway there really is that they have referred to um, the primary precept for the preservation of life. They've referred to the primary precept for the uh, ordering of society. They have referred to the divine law, the Ten Commandments, and they've also referred to... Um, the Catholic Church. So they've named, and this is important actually, they've named Aquinas as our key scholar for natural moral law, but they've also referred to a modern church who actually would still support natural moral law, and they are the Catholic Church. So all the key ingredients in terms of showcasing applied knowledge and understanding are included in terms of what the exam board have written down here. So that gives us, doesn't it, a really clear guide as to what we would be doing in our 10 mark answers. We would be naming Aquinas, we'd be naming the Catholic Church, we'd be naming one or two of the primary precepts, we might be naming one of the tiers of law as well. So always be thinking about your ethical theory, what are the key concepts, what are the key components, and then how are they going to apply. Let's have a look now at a another natural moral law question. This time though, it is the guidance from AQA on this 15 marker. So natural moral law solves the moral problems of abortion, evaluate the statement. So that is obviously asking you, does natural moral law and you know the key components of it, does that provide us with a solution to abortion? Does it solve the moral issues raised by it? So first thing to note is that the exam board always tell examiners that answers may but need not be limited to the consideration of the following. So what they're saying there is you can draw upon any credible knowledge that you've got. Obviously, it's got to be relevant, but don't think you have to restrict yourself. If you have got something in your mind that is from another part of the course that you think that would be really relevant here, absolutely include it. We call that a synoptic link and it will make you stand out as an A, A star candidate. And of course, it's a key skill we need to develop for dialogues anyway, when we are linking together bits of the course. So don't be afraid to do it when you are writing your 15 markers. So what kind of things were the exam board looking for with this question? Well, they said you could write that natural moral law solves the problem of abortion by forbidding it. That's a really great line, isn't it? It solves it by giving us a really clear answer that it's wrong. And we said that before ourselves, didn't we, when we said natural moral law is not, no, it is, sorry, really clear. And it gives really clear answers since it goes against primary precepts such as reproduction and the preservation of innocent life. Insofar as abortion murders innocent life, it also goes against the precept of worshipping God, the creator of life. So they've ticked off three of the precepts there. They've applied them and have said that shows that it does solve the problem by giving a really clear answer. 
However, some argue that not allowing abortion in situations such as rape or where a child is likely to be born with a severe disability solves nothing because whereas some mothers can cope with such situations, others cannot, particularly where their life is in danger. So they've anchored their answer there in the language of the question. They are repeatedly referring back to that statement and they are then bringing in applications and they are making a judgment, which is really crucial. Another point you could include, natural moral law maintains that we can avoid making mistakes in difficult moral situations by using the principle of double effect or the doctrine of double effect. For example, if a pregnant woman has a cancerous uterus, the doctrine of double effect allows her to have a heuristic. I can't speak, excuse me, hysterectomy to save her life, as the death of the fetus is an unintended side effect of saving her life. So you could say that uh, that does help solve the problem because it helps you to avoid making mistakes. So again, nice language that we can steal and use in our own answers. Um, however, some will argue that the principle of double effect is unnecessary in such a case because it is common sense that it is wrong to let both the fetus and the mother die. So actually, does natural moral law overcomplicate things? Does it actually cause more problems and raise more questions than it does provide us with solutions? Um, and the next point, natural moral law's solution to the problems of abortion is strengthened by support from the principle that human life is sacred. Human life is sacred and it is created in God's image. So abortion at any stage is immoral. However, many will argue that this does not solve the overall moral problem with abortion, which is that in specific situations such as pregnancy, through rape, incest or failure of contraception, abortion need not be seen as immoral, even though it is regrettable. So again, we're saying that it is helpful as a solution. It does solve the problem because it is consistent with scripture. So I would maybe be adding in there, it is a strong solution. It does solve the problem for Christians because what it is saying and what it is concluding is in accordance with key Christian beliefs. However, the other point that's been made there is that it's not actually working or it's not a solution that people will like in the modern world where they do take the situation into account. Um, and just a quick note, actually, for you here, that they say for these 15 markers, you will not get more than a level two. You will get much less than half marks if your answer only talks about natural moral law or abortion. And what they're saying there is that in order to get the marks, which is what we already know as A-star students, we've got to consistently apply. Every paragraph has got to refer to both natural moral law and the issue, which in this case is abortion. And remember, at the end of your 50 marker, you have got to make a judgment. You have got to reach that conclusion, haven't you? You've got to say, does natural moral law solve the problem of abortion or does it not? Let's have a look at another 15 marker, shall we? Let's have a look at a virtue ethics question here. And the statement is, virtue ethics has no satisfactory answer to the ethical problems of embryo research. And straight away, I'm thinking there of the evaluation point that virtue ethics is about character development, not giving us clear rules. I could say, no, it's not satisfactory because it's too much about character development rather than giving clear rules. So it doesn't actually help me. It doesn't actually give me an answer to the problem of embryo research. And I'm also thinking there about the fact that when Aristotle developed it, embryo research wasn't a thing. So it can't comment directly on embryo research. But then I'm thinking in my head of counter arguments, I'm thinking of things like, well, hang on, I could talk about the intellectual virtue of episteme and the fact that scientific knowledge can be developed and medical expertise can be developed by doing embryo research. And then I could also think about Barry Schwartz and practical wisdom. And I could say, actually, the pharonesis, you know, that is the goal for virtue ethicists um, is really important here. Also, eudaimonia. Could embryo research help people to achieve eudaimonia because it would help to identify and eliminate genetic diseases, for example? So they are the things that are coming to mind. That's the way I want you to be thinking. When you see that question in the exam room, I want you to be thinking, right, how, you know, how am I going to approach this? What are the key concepts? What are the key components of the ethical theory? How am I going to apply them to this moral issue? So here's what the exam board said you could have included. They say, and they're probably going to say the complete opposite of what I've said now. Let's find out, shall we? 
fingers crossed. Uh, the ethical problems of embryo research focus generally on the status of the embryo. If the embryo is considered a person, then it has the rights that accompany personhood. If it does not, then potentially spare embryos can be used and discarded for embryo research. So, you know, the student there would be credited for including detail on what embryo research is. So it is important to know the moral issues so that you can effectively apply your ethical theories to them. So, whereas in most religious theories of ethics, research that uses embryos as a means to an end or which kills the embryo is considered a, as murder, virtue ethics has no clear rule to follow since the theory focuses on becoming a virtuous person and not on rules or guidelines concerning how this might be achieved. So we said that before, didn't we? And that is something many people would regard as unsatisfactory. So we could say the fact that virtue ethics doesn't provide clear rules, we could say that is therefore unsatisfactory. Our next uh, suggested answer, embryo research has been very useful in IVF treatments and has wide potential in curing a range of diseases such as Parkinson's, diabetes and heart disease. Freedom from these diseases would enable individuals to achieve the virtues that Aristotle considers necessary to achieve eudaimonia. Against this, some might argue that an embryo should be considered as another person. So to achieve eudaimonia at the expense of another person is unethical. So that's quite an interesting way to frame it. I mentioned, didn't I, a moment ago that it could help to achieve eudaimonia by, you know, investigating and ultimately eliminating these diseases. But then what about the embryo research itself? Is that then actually problematic? Because if you consider that embryo as a person, then you are actually causing harm, you know. So can you use that embryo as a means to an end? So really interesting considering the complexity of the moral issue. And then here students might identify specific virtues that so we mentioned before, didn't we, that you always want to be thinking about your virtues and how would they apply, such as courage, um, fortitude, ambition and justice as being particularly relevant to addressing the ethical problems of embryo research. Some might conclude that whether or not stem cell research is virtuous depends on the context or the situation. Others might argue that any situation involving the death of an embryo cannot be virtuous. Some might temporise, um, which is sort of in the middle, by suggesting that the 14-day rule concerning embryo experimentation satisfies the requirements of virtue and of religion, since without development of the primitive streak, an embryo cannot sensibly be called a person. Wow! Someone's clearly had a sip of coffee before they wrote that final line. Um, but as we said, actually, before... We are identifying their particular virtues and we're saying, well, would that virtue be in accordance with, would it support, would it align with embryo research or not? And then again, remember, 15 mark question, you're making a judgment. Do you think virtue ethics provides a satisfactory answer or is it too focused on character development to actually provide us with any clear guidance to follow and use? Let's have a look at one more, shall we? We're going to apply to a non-human issue now, and we're going to look at the third ethical theory, which is situation ethics. So situation ethics cannot justify the use of animals in blood sports. Evaluate this statement. So what kind of things might we be including? And remember, this is very much about would the ethical theory support the issue or not. So it's not necessarily asking you, is situation ethics helpful? It's asking you, what would situation ethics say? So you've got to always, always, guys, read the questions. So important. So non-human animals are biologically similar to humans. So situation ethicists, may argue that animals should be treated agapeistically, what a great word, which includes not being used for a form of human entertainment in which the non-human animal suffers greatly. However, one of the main features of situation ethics is personalism, remember, which is about prioritising people, so the theory does not automatically rule out blood sports. Situation ethics may argue that a practice is either agapeic or it is not, and blood sports are not. Moreover, the motive of those who take part is personal enjoyment at the suffering of other creatures. However, situation ethics might justify a case that fox hunting can be agapeic on the grounds that foxes can inflict great damage on chickens, lambs and other livestock. Think about the chickens. 
Absolutely. Moreover, hunting foxes is less unloving than factory farming, and it also helps to conserve the environment. Well, there you go then. Let's do it. And finally, um, some may argue that there are no situations in which blood sports can be agapaic since the animal suffers unjustified pain. Moreover, the effects of blood sports on those who take part in them can make them insensitive to all forms of suffering, including those involving other people. However, situation ethics holds that all decisions must be made situationally. It does. Always great to include that. So there can be no rules that always apply to the treatment of animals in blood sports, such as bullfighting, game hunting and the like. So, yeah, whenever you talk about situation ethics, you always want to be making that point, don't you, about the fact that love's decisions are made situationally. So it's always going to be about a case by case basis. So you could make the argument that it might justify it in certain circumstances, but not in others. And then obviously give the criteria for making that judgment. OK, let's do one more. Let's do a bonus one. Let's do another virtue ethics one. And this statement says virtue ethics cannot solve the issues raised by using animals as a source of organs for transplant. So can virtue ethics solve the many issues that this raises? So what did AQA think we could say? That rhymed unintentionally. Um, using animals as a source of organs for transplants invariably involves the death of the donor animal and is necessarily done without the animal's consent. For those who argue that animals are members of the moral community, all such organ transplants are therefore immoral and unacceptable. However, Aristotle's virtue theory does not need to address these issues. Remember, we've got the hierarchy of souls, haven't we? It holds that animals are not rational beings and so cannot have moral equality with humans, so they can be used as a source of organ sport transplants. Virtue ethics, next point cannot solve the risk factors associated with using animals as a source of organs for transplants. It is possible that transplant procedures may introduce undesirable changes in the human genome. And that was the worst pronunciation of that word ever, of the human genome, together <laughs> with the risk of rejection. I'm going absolutely delirious, guys. However, a virtue ethicist might consider the risk to be worth taking since the potential benefits to humans include increased scientific knowledge. And of course, we could talk about episteme there, the intellectual virtues. And this avoids the ethical issues of procuring human organs. And finally, with virtue ethics, it is not possible to apply the doctrine of the mean consistently to solve the problems of using animals for transplants. It is impossible to know where virtue lies when procedures are done without consent and there are no consistent procedures for controlling animal pain. However, the virtue ethicist may claim that all of these issues can be solved through future scientific advances, which may benefit the animal kingdom as well as humans. So again, you're using episteme there, aren't you, to justify that. So again, remember, at the end, you would need to make a judgment. You would need to reach a conclusion. Do you think virtue ethics can or cannot solve the issues raised? So I hope that's been helpful. I hope that you found that quite insightful and that you've taken something away from this if you have got any questions at all about any of this please comment them below um, and if you've got any thoughts as well about these application questions please put them down in the comments below but thank you for watching as I say I do hope that's been helpful for you have a great day and very best of luck with your revision bye bye